When we come to church, we devote our worship to recounting our set of beliefs, praying from our collection of prayers, and acting out our series of sacred rituals. And as we take part in these practices and prayers, they can help to shape us over time into mature spiritual beings on the road of following Jesus. At times, over the course of our religious lives, our prayers and practices can comfort us, ground us, center us, even move us to tears as they speak to the deepest places in our souls. But at other times, they can feel like words on a page. They can feel rote. But coming to church anyway in these times, when we're not really feeling it, allows us to be carried along by the collective prayers, beliefs, and rituals that are said by the others around us, as if we were passengers in a riverboat. That's one way of, of seeing how our rhythmic worship can shape our lives. How we pray shapes how we see God, and how we see the world, and how we see one another. As the Rabbi Harold Kushner said, religion is not primarily a set of beliefs, a collection of prayers, or a series of rituals. Religion is first and foremost a way of seeing. On this St. Patrick's Day, I'm mindful that for millennia, the mystical world of Celtic spirituality saw the world in terms of thin places, glimpses of the material and spiritual worlds coming together. A thin place might be a moment or experience or a place where you sense the sacred as intimately present. The Celts saw, in God, saw God in thin places everywhere, maybe an encounter on the road with a stranger, in the breeze in a tree, in a stone on the road. The glory of God to them was everywhere in these thin places. And God was present, moving and working and loving the whole created order and all people. They saw this so much so that Patrick, Columba, Bridget, the saints who most notably evangelized the Celtic world, famously embraced the pagan symbols and practices they encountered. Instead of eliminating and replacing those symbols, these saints offered a pagan people a brand new way of seeing the symbols and rituals they already held dear by using them to bring the gospel of love from Jesus to them. The circle of the Celtic cross on the cover of our bulletins is said to come from St. Patrick's understanding of pre-Christian Celts worship of the sun. Patrick incorporated the sun circle as a way of expressing Jesus' eternal nature and the light and life that God so freely bestows on all of creation. St. Bridget founded a convent at Kildare, which was the center of the cult of a pagan goddess. There, a sacred fire had been kept burning for the goddess for generations, and Bridget chose not to extinguish it. Instead, she could see in the pagan monument an opportunity to reclaim the flame as the eternal light of Christ, ever burning. And with this renewed vision, was able to create companionship rather than conflict among the pagans that she evangelized. Through their unique gifts of spiritual insight, Patrick, Bridget, and their fellow Celtic saints approached the world with love rather than conquest. They fostered appreciation for the other's experience of God rather than domination and erasure of the other's story. Our way of seeing determines whether we will walk the path of our life by fear and division or by love and compassion. In my childhood Episcopal church in Greeley, Colorado, there's an inscription straight out of today's gospel on the preacher's side of the pulpit that says, we wish to see Jesus. It's written for the preacher's eyes only as an awakening reminder of why the people to whom they preach have come to church, for nothing less than to see Jesus. Christianity is a way of seeing and coming to see Jesus and what he came to do in the deepest sense is the spiritual work of our lifetimes. Coming to see Jesus is one of the most, if not the most, significant theme in John's gospel, which is a gospel filled with significant words and themes. 
And today, wishing to see Jesus is the desire that sets the scene for Jesus' profound teaching that follows about the kind of death he is to die and how it can be seen in the end as life-giving for the whole world and fruitful. How we come to see Jesus determines how we come to see everything. In chapter one of John's gospel, Jesus invites his first disciples, that included Philip and Andrew, with the words, come and see. They're asking to know where he's staying. But Jesus invites them to see something far beyond the place where he's actually staying that night. He extends to them, he intends to show, but Jesus intends to show them a whole life of coming to see where he truly dwells in God's eternal presence of love for us and for the whole world. But it's a vision much greater than they could yet see. And a little later in John's gospel, Nicodemus, a Jewish leader and member of the high court, comes to Jesus at night, in the dark, to find out who Jesus really is. And Nicodemus coming in the dark is no small detail, for he can barely understand what Jesus says to him. Nicodemus' ability to see what Jesus tries to tell him about being reborn in the spirit is on the level of one groping around in a dark room with no light. But Jesus' engagement with him begins to shine a light that Nicodemus eventually comes to see. Similarly, when we come here to see Jesus, sometimes it takes us years to see past the expectations we arrive with and to see something new. When those Greeks asked to see Jesus, I bet neither they nor Philip and Andrew were expecting to hear Jesus respond with a parable of a single grain needing to fall into the earth to die before it can bear much fruit. But this beautiful image speaks directly to all of us when our vision of God is too small. How fully are we seeing Jesus in our lives? Jesus' hour has come when the single grain of his earthly life is about to die, and all those who know him as that single grain of his physical presence can't possibly imagine the fruit his life and death, resurrection and ascension will bear in them. In the crucified Jesus, we might see the victims of our own violence in every time and place. In the risen Christ, we might see the concrete offer of forgiveness and a new beginning, another chance to see and accept that God's whole being is love, not division. God's whole being is compassion, not hatred. God's whole being is bringing things to life, not killing. The tomb in which Jesus is buried turns out to be a garden. We live much of our own lives as single grains, isolated, small in our ability to see the presence and love of God all around us. But the soil of our fear and disappointment, the places where we suffer frustration or loneliness, just might be our thin places, not where God has forgotten us, but where God can go to work in us, often in the dark where we cannot see, and tills and tends the soil until we are raised into flourishing, flowering beings. There is so much God can do when we will let our small visions and self-preserving fears fall away and let love grow in us. As an ancient saying goes, no seed ever sees the flower. We can't begin to see all that God can do in us before we have ventured into the soil of prayer and surrender and the quietude of our uncertainties. We can't see all that God can do with the single grains of our lives until we come wishing to see Jesus and daring to follow him in his way of dying and being raised to new life. So this is the last week of our Lenten wilderness before we journey into Holy Week. With all of its chances for quietude and contemplation of the fullness of God's love that Jesus embodied at every turn in death and in life. The full moon of Easter is nearly upon us. The poet Rumi wrote, inside this new love, die. Your way begins on the other side. Become the sky. 
take an ax to the prison wall, escape. Walk out like someone suddenly born into color. Do it now. You're covered with thick cloud. Slide out the side. Die and be quiet. Quietness is the surest sign that you've died. Your old life was a frantic running from silence. The speechless full moon comes out now. May our treasured religious practices in these coming weeks provide for us nothing less than a new way of seeing Jesus. And may our wish to see Jesus be met with new love in all the thin places of our lives. <laughs>